everyone, this is Chris Grasso with The Healing Journey presented by Toivo by Advocacy Unlimited. And I'm very excited today to have my guest Sandra Marinella with me. Sandra, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you, Chris. It's it's great to be here. Thank you. So um, I just want to read your bio very quickly before we get uh, into discussing your new book, which I'm very excited to talk to you about because I know it's going to resonate deeply for many, if not all, of our audience today. Uh, but before we get to that, Sandra Marinella has taught thousands of students and fellow educators, presented dozens of workshops at the Veterans Hospital Phoenix and the Virginia Piper Cancer Center, Scottsdale, and is expanding into a variety of health and wellness settings. She lives in Phoenix, Arizona. Her website is www.storyutell.com. And for anyone listening or watching, that will be linked. So if you miss that, uh, we'll have it linked right up on the page for you. Sandra, again, thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm really excited to talk to you about this book because we were briefly speaking um, before the interview and I'd mentioned I've written a couple of books myself okay. and, uh, and it was almost haphazardly that they became books. I started writing as part of my own healing journey and sharing with various websites that accepted unsolicited material. And next thing I know, I'm being introduced to a literary agent and a book deal and then another one and now my third book's coming out. And it's just been incredible to me that it, what a cathartic experience it truly has been like sharing this story in a very candid and intimate way. So, you know, that's just a little bit about me and why I'm passionate to talk to you about your work. Um, But I wanted to start, you know, with your book, The Story You Need to Tell. In your own words, uh, you'd written or said that it's about digging deep and finding the stories in you that need to be explored. It's a guide to transform transforming your life story, which, again, I saw that and I'm like, yeah, I really resonate and understand with that. And I would love if we can start there and have you expand, you know, why why did you write this book and how does it help us as we write transform our life stories chris um in 2012 i learned i had breast cancer and i think that's always a shock of course and i've read um i i've read a little bit about your story as well and i know that that you've had quite a story so i think when we are faced um with a difficult story in particular we are um, forced to uh, figure out who we are. We are forced to confront it. And I wrote the book largely because uh, I had been a writing teacher all of my life and passionate about words and passionate about story and the power of story. I'd seen it in my classroom, my high school classrooms and my college classrooms for decades, for three decades actually. So that when I faced cancer, I thought, whoa, um, I was using my own journal to write my way through the cancer, mm. find my words, and define my story. And in doing this, uh, I had to ask myself, does this help other people, <laughs> or does it just help me? Yeah. And I started looking when I was recovering from one of my surgeries, I started digging through 27 of my old journals, and I realized I had used reflective writing all of my life, personal writing, all of my life in, the, in my journals to help me navigate all kinds of difficulties, not just this cancer. I had used it for my personal um, um, postpartum depression when I had my second baby. Mm. I had used the tragic death of my brother. Um, and now I, I, could, I could see that I was using it um, at, to get my way, make my way through my cancer. So I thought, okay, if this is true, if this is true for me, is it, is it, um, true for others. So I began to do research and I discovered that here I'd been a writing teacher and seen this practice in my classroom for years, but there were studies. James Pennybaker had done study after study and his students and other researchers across the nation um, had started studying the power of personal writing and they confirmed that it's amazing what personal writing can do. So I wanted to do something with that, and as I healed, um, I, I decided the best thing to do was to take this personal writing out into the community yeah. and work with fellow cancer patients and work with um, veterans, 
my husband is a, is a disabled veteran, yeah. and he was adamant. He said, this work should not only belong to those with illnesses, but you should take it definitely um, outside of that, to prisons, to veterans, um, to people who are struggling with drugs and other, other issues. Yeah. And so I, I could only manage two uh, when I was doing the research and writing the book, but I did start working at um, Piper Cancer Center with cancer patients, and I went downtown to the Veterans Hospital and began volunteering with just a series of veterans, and their stories were so overpowering, and watching them take the writing and use it to transform their lives, um, it, it was a gift. I mean, it was just yeah. a, an exciting time for me, and I very much felt, um, oh, writing is not simply therapeutic, it's transformative, um, this is your book. <laughs> you need yeah. to write, Sandra. And so that's that's why I wrote this book. I absolutely love that. So as I'm listening to you um, share that, and here's the inspiration, a question I'm often asked uh, by aspiring writers is, you know, I, I have this book inside of me. What do I do next? And it can be a tricky question to answer because uh, I, I am very candid myself that uh, I didn't even finish an associate's degree in college. I did not go to school for writing. I've never taken a formal writing class. I literally, very similar to what you were saying earlier, was I started writing about experiences I had had in a way that all I wanted to do was help others to potentially avoid even one, if not all of the pitfalls that I continue to fall into. And you know, both of my first two books are traditionally published, which is not the easiest route to go, as yours is. Self-publishing is definitely easier, and I think both both routes have pros and cons. But um, I can imagine someone sitting here listening, you know, already thinking, okay, I do have a story to tell. I don't know what to do next, you know. And unfortunately, as we both know, when it comes to traditional publishing, there needs to be not in all cases, but most, you know, the marketing is taken into place and um, social media and this and that. So I guess my question is, if I'm a listener right now who feels like they have this story that needs to be told, what would you recommend to them? I think um, the place where I started, um, of course, was um, sharing my stories with my friends, with yeah. people that and that I was comfortable with, yeah, and and talking. Um, I think we all have stories, and they're all they're not necessarily all bad stories. I mean, right. we obviously need our stories to define who we are, and we want to pull those out of us and and make sure that that they're stories that we're um, that we're happy with because we have a lot of power over story. Yeah. So as as if I were someone starting this writing process, I would start by sharing stories with friends mm. by. Stories by talking. Um, oftentimes, writers come to me and say, "I'm blocked. I can't write." And I start talking with them and asking them questions, and boom, the stories are all over the place. Right. So, and and not and once once you start the talking, then I think it's very easy to begin the free writing. And this is where the journal comes in. In your case, um, you've you've turned, I think, more to the podcast to express yourself and to mm to put ideas out there and to share ideas. Um, there's so many different ways to share our ideas now. You can do a public blog. You can do a private journal if you don't want to be public. But I, I would definitely turn to some form of writing and try it and some practice. I know Julia Cameron has the age-old book, The Artist's Way, that, that argues that three pages every day, you should get up and write three mm -hmm. pages every day to get your writing going. And I'm definitely not one that does that. <laughs> like you, I'm, you know, I, I have found my own pattern. Right. I really argue with every writer that I work with, you have to find your own pattern. You have to find what fits your life and will take you forward with your words. And if that's a journal, uh, that's a great place to start. The free writing is a place to start. Yeah. Um, if you need prompts, there are many great books out there yep, with prompts. There I think the story you need to tell provides a series of them. Um, my goal was to be able to guide people who were out there on their own struggling right. 
in trying to figure out how do I get through this illness or this loss or this difficult um, breakup in a love relationship, whatever difficulty or trauma you're experiencing, there are prompts to kind of guide you so that you can write about them and see if you're comfortable with them. But my biggest idea here would be that everybody can find a writing pattern. I'd be interested in knowing what yours is, Chris. Well, so here's what's interesting, Sandra, is I love what you said a moment ago about, uh, and I, I apologize, I forgot the woman's name, where she says, right, was it three pages or 3,000? Yes, yeah. Julia Cameron's classical. Yeah, and I've heard different uh, suggestions from different writers, many of which I deeply respect, but what I have found is I have to be true to myself, and I liken it to, I'm a musician before a writer, Um I grew up, you know, I taught myself how to play guitar, just like writing. Like I said, I'd never taken a writing class. I never took a guitar lesson. I self-taught drums. So when I would start writing my own music, I would find it would either flow and I would just be in that flow state Mm -hmm. or it wouldn't. And I would be forcing it and I would get frustrated and I would just end up like, you know, throwing my guitar down and walking away, huffing and puffing. And I found the same thing happened with writing for me. Either it's going to just come out naturally and flow or it's going to be forced. And I actually was giving a talk to my old high school. Um, I gave a, a, an all school assembly last November. And then I was fortunate to be invited to their uh, literary, the, the literary classes that were being taught. And I'll never forget at one point I said this. I said, I know that some teachers will say you have to write, you know, 1000 words a day or something, no matter what. And I, I- say, no. I say, if you do not feel moved in your heart to write, then do not write. And I remember the laser beams from the teacher's eyes. And I said, unless you're in high school and you have a teacher you have to answer to. And in that case, you write a thousand words a day. But but so, no, that's my thing is that I I can't force it. Like I, I, I see both sides of it. I understand why they say that. I could see why being a guitarist, if they say practice for 20 minutes, these scales every day, you'll be a better guitarist. I am sure that that is true, but f- part of me has a hard time with that because it feels very forced and inauthentic. And um, right. so that's so that's my end of it. I just I write when I feel compelled to. And there have been times literally where I will go three or four months and not write a single word. And uh, there will be times where I will write for three or four months straight, you know, almost without stop. So, yeah. How about yourself? I I usually go um, to a cafe every morning because if I I don't, I I start doing the wash or the dishes, the things that that, um, will eat the day away and take the writing right out of me. So I I usually go to a cafe and I hide there um, for two or three hours. And now I usually tackle a writing project. But when I have an issue or when I have um, a topic that I think is important to explore in my life, um, my brother and I were having an interesting conversation when he when he came last week, and it was about the suffering in the world, and it was really upsetting him. And I found it very very helpful um, to go into my journal and explore, you know, my response to that. And I plan to share that with him. But I needed to wade through that in my own mind. I needed to reflect right. on it. And when he was shooting these hard and difficult philosophical questions at me, I had no answer. Um, I had to think, and and that's, for me, that is the amazing value in in writing, is that we can take our thought processes, and we can reflect, we can can pull them down, and we can use them. So I do probably tackle my journal um, one or two, sometimes three times a week, for maybe 20 minutes, but if something like the discussion with my brother is powerful, um, I can find myself using my morning writing hour to really explore and, and think about that. And sometimes that'll turn into an essay. Yeah. But I do try every morning to start with my writing. I see myself as a writer. Yeah. Um, but I, having taught thousands of students, I think the pattern is just so different for each one of us as you right. elaborated. And the goal is to find, to find the one that fits you. Right. Yeah. Right. And I think that's why I do. You mentioned uh, me doing the podcast is, I find at times I I don't feel like I personally have much to say as far as writing. I'll still teach and I'll do workshops, but 
I am a student just as much as a teacher. I, when people call me a teacher, it makes me feel weird. Like I feel like when I lead workshops, which I'm always honored to do, or I speak at festivals and not to be cliche, cause I mean this from the bottom of my heart, I will speak to people there and learn probably more than from them than they did from me. So oh, yeah. absolutely. That's yeah. a beautiful statement. I, I really like that, Chris. I'm going to, I'm going to jump right in on it because Go for it. I, I always felt so um, honored to be a teacher because I was really the student. <laughs> I was right. really, you know, you're really there. Um, I think if you're doing the kind of teaching you should be doing, you're learning. You're learning with your students and you're exactly. helping them explore and open up in new ways. So um, I love that you said that. I think that's that's very, very true, that remaining a student as much as a teacher is is critical. Uh-huh. Yeah, it, it it has been for me at least, and, and it keeps myself in check or helps me too. But that's why I'm so passionate about podcasts is because this is a great chance for me to learn from you or my other guests. Like we have a nice conversation. I share a little of my experience, but I absolutely adore learning from people whose work I respect, you know, who are out there in the world with heart, with integrity, trying to really serve humanity in a way that is going to help us heal. I mean... The subtitle of this book, when I read it right away, it, it just it touched me deeply. Writing to heal from trauma, illness, or loss. You know, aside from the work I do in my own writing and speaking, I work with a nonprofit in Connecticut called Toivo. And that's what we do, not just with writing, and we do offer writing ca- classes, but we also go into the jail cells in the psychiatric hospitals and um, the, the f- just a number of different facilities, as well as hold courses always free or donation-based to offer these modalities to people that need them. They don't have access to them. And I, you know, that's why this book deeply resonated with me is that it's, I feel like it's very accessible to literally anyone. You can pick this up and it's going to like get you on that path. If you feel called to write to heal, here's your book. So what I I guess my next question is, yeah, no, really it's a wonderful book. Um, Can you give an example of maybe a story you need to tell? I mean, I I believe we all have one, but if you have an example, um, that would be wonderful. Okay. Yes. I I don't know why um, it keeps resonating with me that um, even good stories are stories we need to share and tell. I don't know why I keep needing to say that lately. But uh, in my writing for so long, I was so focused on um, very riveting, very traumatic stories. Sure. And those, of course, are important to tell um, for psychological and physical reasons. Um, we often take difficult experiences and bury them inside, and they become unhealthy for us. So one of those stories that I saw in the course of writing this book um, is the story of Matthew uh, Goldie Goldston. And he is uh, a veteran from Afghanistan, and he had been overseas in 2009, and this was his first experience with constant firefights, living in the midst of of war. And he was truly um, um, traumatized by this experience. And when I put out a call, when I started writing this book, I I wrote an email um, to the veterans I was working with, and I said, are any of you willing to talk with me one-on-one and tell me the story? you know, your stories. And so I began meeting with um, Goldie at, I think it was in Applebee's, we began to meet about once a month and share his stories. And it was amazing the things that he had been asked to do and the things that he had experienced and the trauma that he had undergone when he was at war. Mm -hmm. And he had gone off to war, his wife had stuck this little green journal in his backpack and she said, you're going to need this. You don't know this, but you're going to need wow. it. And so he took it with him, and he did do some writing. Um, but he told me, when you're at war, um, you're facing things that you just don't expect. And one of the stories, one of his stories, um, is the story of his dear, dear friend Nick Hand, very close to Nick Hand. And one day they're in a firefight, and they're warding off the Taliban. And Nick calls out his name, and Goldie turns to Nick, and of course, Nick has been shot in the head and is falling into um, the arms of Goldie. And Goldie said, whoa, 
that was the beginning. That was the beginning of my PTSD. How do, how do you cope? How do you deal um, with the death right in your arms of one of your dearest friends, somebody you love? And you're supposed to buck up and take your rifle and keep fighting. Um, so Goldie said it, it was really, really tough. You were asked to buck up and bury these things inside. Yeah. And he was he was he did both um, hide it and share it. I mean, he did some journal writing, but it was very limited. It was a new experience for him. And it really wasn't until he came back to the United States, back to back to the um, base um, that he began to see a psychiatrist and realized that he had stories hidden inside, stories that were hurting and that, that really needed to be shared and needed to come out so he could understand them and um, reframe them and learn a way to make this death um, manageable in his life. Yeah. Well, that's an example of a story. Yeah. And so what I'm hearing as you're saying this is that a lot of people who feel like they have a story to tell, and they, we all do, you know, I mean, we all have our own very unique human experience, sometimes feel like I need to tell it to the world, but maybe that's not necessarily the case. Maybe you just need to write it for yourself or for your family, or again, going back to maybe self-publish it, you know, for some friends. Um, but I would love to, to, to hear from you what in your experience are some of the benefits uh, to, you know, telling our story, to writing it out, to, again, the subtitles, healing and trauma, you know, and I, and I understand that. But, you know, when we start to really mm-hmm. put it out in a way that's cathartic, like what, what are some of the benefits that we can experience or, or potentially will experience with that? Uh, I, I think probably the catharsis is is critical i think the fact if we have a hard story um often we can't give it out for a while i think there's the shock and the trauma and the silence um and our bodies and our minds need to adjust to this difficult thing that has happened to us but i do think when you break your silence um and and for some reason i'm thinking of ellie weissel he always comes to mind because i love his books so much but the great writer ellie weissel um, said after after his experience in the concentration camps that he could not write about it for at least 10 years. And it was, I think, 1960 before he began to publish his series of books on what he experienced. He was so traumatized. But when he did that, when he broke that silence, um, you can see the power of his words. You can see the beauty of the story he told yeah. and the message that he brought to the world, the importance of bringing that message. So I think when we share our difficult stories, um, we help others find their way um, to catharsis and resilience. Mm-hmm. But um, I think probably the most important thing is you, you get a catharsis, um, you break your silence, you can also begin to find meaning. And when you can begin to find meaning in a story and make sense of it and rework it in your life, you own that story. Yeah. It doesn't own you anymore. It doesn't control you anymore. And you're not ruminating about it. It's not dancing around in your brain, driving you crazy. And so once you you can frame it, it's not draining all that negative energy from mm-hmm. you. And you find a piece in yourself um, to move forward, to charge forward. And I, I call that process that I seem to see over and over again uh, in the veterans and the cancer patients that I worked with, I call that story transformation. And while there's a lot of research out there that says um, telling our stories does great physical things for our lives, I think the power of transforming your life with your story of changing your life, of making it better, is to me the most important thing that can happen. Hmm. Well, one thing I want to mention before I wanted to follow up on that, because I know you've done extensive work with veterans and cancer patients, which is obviously no small thing. One thing I did want to note is for anyone listening who is interested in writing, um, and you made a great suggestion earlier, you can start your own blog. There's a number of ways to do it. Um, if you, I just wanted to suggest a few websites to people. I'm not advocating for them over any others they're just ones i'm familiar with but if you visit sites like elephantjournal.com mindbodygreen.com yoganonymous.com 
um, even Huffington Post. I know that one's a little bit tougher, but uh, often people ask me, well, how did you get started? And these were the websites that I started writing for because I felt like, yes, I wanted to write for me, but I also wanted to share and 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 get that story out again, like I said earlier, and maybe a way that someone will read it and it'll benefit them so they don't have to suffer in the same way I did. But you were mentioning, so I just want to put that little caveat in there in case anyone's wondering of some outlets. Um, but I would love to hear a bit more about this extensive work that you have done with veterans and cancer patients. And I mean, this is such a big question, I feel, but like, what have you learned from them and that experience of working with them so oh. candidly? Oh, my goodness. I um, Very different populations, um, yeah. veterans and the cancer patients. I'll start. I'll start with the veterans because sure. I've already heard the story of of Goldie. Yeah. And uh, Goldie and many of the veterans that I've worked with. I think the most powerful thing I learned is that they are so acculturated to hold their stories inside, to hold the pain inside, uh, and they return from war. And I mean, I have worked with veterans of Vietnam and veterans of. Kuwait and veterans of Afghanistan, Iraq, um, they all have trouble talking about their experiences and what they went through and what they've done. And often um, what I learned from them is the writing is such a powerful and helpful transition yeah. to put the story gently and easily out there, whether it's in a poem or in a script. And I'm a big advocate of that. I don't think it has to be just free writing in a journal, Sure. free writing in a blog. If you're interested in writing a play, if your experiences, um, you know, come to you in that form, then I say, share it that way. I mean, put it out there in the way that works for you. Once again, we, I, I think we have a kindred <laughs> spirit here uh, in believing that the individual kind of has to find their way of finding their words. Right. Um, so I, I was really shocked, and a couple of the veterans that I worked with told me they had actively, actively thought about suicide, and of course, I did some research for my book and found out what, there's 18 to 22 veteran suicides per day, and they say, no, you know, <laughs> they have been acculturated to hold this stuff in, and we have to, we have to break that cycle, we yeah. really do. I, I hope that um, the book will resonate um, with veterans for that reason, because um, it's certainly a guide to help that process change. Sure. Now, cancer patients, um, I, I, I would love to tell you just a little bit about a personal story with one yeah. cancer. Would that be okay? Uh, you don't have to ask. I would love to hear it. Okay. I When I started um, this journey, my surgeon said to me, Sandra, I would love for you to work with Jennifer Camposano because she's 32 and she has stage four cancer. She probably does not have long to live. Um, she just had a baby and she would very much like to leave her story for those people she loves. And so I began um, working with Jen, writing, to, writing her story, working to tell her story. And she was already immersed in the power of words. She already understood that she was possibly facing death and that she wanted to um, share her story. So she had started a very public blog, uh, partly because people were asking her all the time about her current situation, and she couldn't return all these phone calls. <laughs> and also because she just felt it might help other people in the same circumstance. So she started this blog that really resonated with the community, and I followed her blog, and I worked with her, and we began this long journey of three years together going to chemo every third week. Hmm. And she had reoccurrences and drug problems, and um, the struggle went on and on and on, but Jen has survived her cancer. And, and I look at her, and... I am amazed, and I, I still meet with her frequently. We still talk, but she's no longer in chemo, and um, we don't know her cancer could come back, but she seems to sure. And the thing I learned from her is I would sit in chemo, and I would say, Jen, how are you doing this? And she would talk to me all the time about 
This cancer does not own me. Mm. I have it. It doesn't own me. I own it. Mm. And she navigated this very difficult journey with such beauty and with such positive words and such upbeat attitude, always hanging on to the things she loved, her family, her friends, mm. her writing. She's finished a book on her cancer journey. And um, just the power, I, I think I learned from her that you can be in the middle of this life storm, this tornado, and you can choose to step into the middle and really live fully. Yeah. Because she did that. And I, I can't tell you how many days I wake up and think, I'm going to be just like Jen today. <laughs> I'm going to live in the middle of the tornado <laughs> and that, find the peace. That's incredibly beautiful. And, and I say that because it makes me think of, uh, well, I know a number of uh, breast cancer survivors, you know, thank God. And uh, one of them is a dear friend of mine. Her name is Kate Bartolotta. And I remember she had written about her experience. And what she wrote has forever changed the way I experience illness in my life. And I've been going through some personal stuff myself that uh, I'm not going to get into today because I literally just found out this week. But um, I will tell you what she said about her cancer is that, you know, most people, there's the F cancer stickers and, you know, you know, it, all this angst against cancer. And I get that. It takes our loved ones and it's tragic and horrible. But she made the decision that I'm going to love my cancer because it is a part of who I am and I'm going to hold it in that reverence and that respect that I would hold any other part of myself. And, uh, I just remember reading that and, and it, like, I, yeah, I teared up. I'm like, that is such a beautiful sentiment and statement. You know, Jen said to me at one point that she, she went to um, a support group and she said, it, it became very clear to her that there were those people who were determined to survive cancer and were talking positively, you know, telling stories of how we're going to live and what we're going to do. Yeah. And, she, and then there was the other group that just said, when I die all the time. And she said it was so, so shocking to her that people would choose to view their cancer as something that owned them and would take them away no matter what. And uh, she, I, I really think that that was profound for me as your friend's writing was for you because I thought we have, we do have control over how we look at things, yeah. how we interpret things, and we should seize that. And I'm grateful, really grateful to have worked with cancer patients for that reason. They've, they've taught me a lot about that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, the line of work I do not so much with cancer patients, but going into hospitals and detoxes and seeing youth 13 to 18 who have already tried to commit suicide, you know, you see this and it's just, yeah, wow. Yeah. It can be such a valuable learning lesson still in my own life. You know, having gone all th gone through everything I have, I go there to try to serve them, but I leave realizing they serve me far more than anything I could have offered them though. It's always nice when I get that email a month or two later when they've gotten out, hey, I'm doing really great. Mm -hmm. Something you said meant a lot and this and that. It's like, wow. And it reminds me, you know, because the work we do, it's not easy. Um, not that we're, you know, martyrs or heroes. It's just we're doing what our hearts have called us to do. And and oftentimes that's very difficult. Um, and so something actually I wanted to ask you about is something I talk about. You know, I teach many practices in my workshops and different mo ways of working with our pain and our suffering. And uh, sometimes I've been asked, you know, is there a point where the pain can be too much to work with in the moment? Um, you know, because I offer these practices of holding it like a mother would a newborn baby or, you know, that's one of my favorites. But, you know, my answer every time has been absolutely, I do believe there are certain times in life where the most compassionate thing we can do, which is counterintuitive to what most of us have been taught on the spiritual path, is instead of leaning into that pain, allowing ourselves to walk away and put some space between it. Whether that means turning on a comedy, going for a walk, getting ice cream, turning on one of your favorite songs really loud. To me, those can be much more compassionate acts than sitting with it in that moment. So that's just my two cents, you know, and, and I say that to say, yes, come back to it when the space is, you know, been there and it's settled. But mm -hmm. I do believe sometimes it can be too much. So do you feel like 
there are times where it can be too much for a person um, to not write in order to heal. Do you, are there certain scenarios where you think maybe they should take a little space or time? Oh, absolutely. I, I think, um, as I said earlier, I think the first stage in our shock is um, it, it's trauma. I mean, we're just traumatized. And yeah. I think our brain is, is perplexed and confused and having to absorb um, something that we don't want to absorb. And I think it's very unhealthy, um, very unhealthy to sit down and, and write at that point. Sure. Um, I think you need this space. I think there's so much research now that shows that silence and quiet um, will help our brains regenerate and find it, find where we're at and, and allow in the pain. and the, the and There's going to be, with shock and trauma, there's going to be suffering. I mean, there's no getting around it. Right. There's going to be um, a period of time when you need to go through that. And, and I, I have come to believe from uh, personal experiences, I think one of the first ones was a student that I had who was um, was working at a Walmart on a Sunday afternoon and and he went out um, with the security guard. The security guard sort of haphazardly asked him to go out and chase down a man that had had taken a, a television from the store. So they followed this thief until he's parked in a parking lot of a church and he jumped out of his car and took a gun and took it and shot them both in the head and killed them instantly. So my student died. And the next day we came back to school and we were all just shocked. I mean, this was one of those kids that everybody in the school knew and loved. Sure. He was not an A student, that kind of a kid, just spunky, fun, lovable, bright kid that you wanted in your classroom because he was a spark plug, yeah. a, a, a charmer. But we were all really, really upset. And there's, there's no way I could have asked my students to write about that. They needed space and time. I mean, we just backed away. Um, we inched forward very slowly with that situation, and I, I bet it was at least two weeks before, after a service at the school, that we actually, you know, began gently to talk and write about um, this thing. But clearly, I think you're right. I think some of the most Im important things we can realize as instructors and teachers um, of writing is that there are points when you should not write. Mm -hmm. You absolutely should not write if you're not ready. For that, the breaking of the silence is important, and even that will be painful. Yeah. Um, but, but yes, you're. I'm. I'm with you totally on that one, Chris. Ah, uh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, it's because again, I know it's a, it's a common sentiment that, you know, no matter what of great wisdom tradition it is, it could be Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity. Like, you feel mm -hmm. the pain, and you know, and and I and I agree with that for the most part because. You know, we start to suppress things and that's what creates the shadow material, this repression. And then we need to reown this stuff and that becomes a whole vicious cycle. Sure. But yeah. again, there are certain times where like um, I think of I'm in Connecticut and Sandy Hook's not that far from me. And, you know, when that tragedy happened, I couldn't imagine trying to tell someone right about this, you know, a week later. Like I couldn't right. even imagine that. Um, no, no, no. no you need time to process and 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 i often will will try to bring levity and say like there's no trophies given out for spiritual warriorship you know so you're not here to prove anything to anyone you're here to do the best you can each day right and today might be a little better than yesterday tomorrow might be a little worse than today but as long as you're trying and putting forth the effort right. what more can you ask for you know right. so Good. Well yeah, so there's something else I wanted to ask you about because this is something I get asked often and um, I found myself answering it in numerous ways, but what do you say to someone who doesn't like to write but feels like they need to tell their story? And I am very curious about this because, like I said, I've gone a number of different ways in my answer with this. So what are, what are your two cents on the topic? <laughs> it's okay to tell your story. I think a lot of the, um, a lot of the properties of healing that come from writing can come from sharing stories as well. And the way I handled it with my father, my father knew, my father died a couple of years ago and I was busy. I was engaged in writing this book and doing the research and, and he had had several falls and mm. um, was struggling. And I, 
encouraged him. I said, hey, do you want to try the writing? And he's like, oh, no, I don't write. No way. I'm not writing. Right. And so I suggested maybe that I come in and write the stories for him. And he said, well, I could tape some of the stories, which he did. So we taped some of the stories. And then um, we found it was more fun if I came in and I wrote some of his stories. And then ironically, after I wrote a few of them and he read them, he decided he was going to start writing them. So I wow. think it inspired him um, because maybe he thought I was messing his personal stories <laughs> up. I don't know. Sure. I wanted him to, to take off. But I think um, we can always tell other people. We can share it in support groups. We can um, share it with family and friends. Um, we can tape what we've done. Um, I work with one man who has MS and he no longer can write. But he works through, uh, he really wants to tell his story, a beautiful, beautiful story. He was a professor at Arizona State, and now he's losing his facilities. Okay. So he's begun to write his story by um, speaking his story and having it transcribed for him. Wow. So there's different ways of managing this, and I, again, believe it, it depends on the individual and what they're comfortable with. I always want to make people comfortable with their words, not uncomfortable with their words. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. That's really well said. I, the answer I've come to, and it's just become my go-to, is if it's meant to be written, there's nothing that's going to stop it from being written, yourself included. You're not going to be able to get in your own way. I truly do believe, and it might sound cliche, but if the quote-unquote universe or whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. needs that story to be put out there, even if it's just to 5, 10, 15, 20 people or 5, 10, 15, 20,000 it's going to happen. And so I guess it's part of my punk root, uh, punk rock roots that I tell them, if you're going to do it, you throw all caution to the wind. You write for yourself, yourself only, no audience. Don't filter yourself. You write and write and write like today was your last day on earth. You write like you needed to get it all out today. And that seems to work for some people. Others, no. But that's I like it. I like it a lot. And it, it strikes a chord because I'm thinking as you talked about your punk root roots. Punk rockers, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That we we put those stories out there in different ways. Yes. We can we can put our punk rock out in story form or we can paint or we can yes. there's so many different modes and ways. Yes. I have never forgotten when I was in my twenties I had a friend who dragged me to a retrospective of Picasso's artwork. Cool. And at the time I was not into it at all. Yeah. But by the time I walked out of the retrospective, I was like, whoa. I was amazed at how he told his story in his paintings, but he also scribbled little things on napkins and yeah. shirts. And that, of course, because he's famous, they kept them all. But I thought, right. there's so many different avenues for somehow slipping your story into the universe. Mm such a great point and thank you for saying that because I actually don't say that enough even being a musician myself I don't have the artistic skill but I write music all the time and uh, thank you what a great point it doesn't just have to you know you can write in various ways absolutely yeah absolutely. beautifully said well so the one thing I wanted to, to wrap up with um, first of all well two questions first is what is the biggest takeaway that you hope people you know who read this book discover in their own lives you know what 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 would you like you know what's your vision for them at least your hope for them after reading this wow i i think um story is so magical story is who we are we are composed of stories we're made up of stories and i fully think doing the research for this the neuroscience tells us that um, we not only are defined by stories, but we have the power to transform our stories, mm. to change our life story, to make it a better story. And I really, that's, that's the biggest takeaway for me, understanding that, yes, we will have pain, we will have struggles. I mean, we all will do things that we're not proud of or something will happen to us that will, you know, shatter, shatter some piece of our lives. Of course. And we can come to an understanding of, of how to let the silence heal it and then how to break our silence and then how to accept our story mm -hmm. 
and give it meaning and refuse it, reframe it in our lives so that we can move forward in really positive ways. For example, my own cancer, the fact that I was able to write about it, I never planned to publish a book on it. Sure. Um, I planned to write a story about other people's struggles. And then my writing group said, wait a minute, <laughs> where's your story? And I, I framed, went back and put my story in the book and the transformation was amazing. It was so helpful um, to take a story I couldn't even talk about when I first experienced it. And you, you were indicating earlier in your own life there's things going on. I'm not ready to talk about it yet. Right. And, and we have we constantly have that. Well, it was a long time before I could talk about my cancer, but now the transformation has been. I talked about it, and it's a story I've given out, and um, that's just so liberating and. Um, it gives you, it allows us so much personal growth that I would really hope that people who read the book would discover that, that power of story transformation. Well, I can't recommend it enough. The name of the book is The Story You Need to Tell, Writing to Heal from Trauma, Illness, or Loss by Sandra Marinella. And Sandra, the last thing I want to ask is if you could just, I know we talked about it earlier, but if you can tell people where they can find you online, they can learn more about you and your work, or if you have any speaking events coming up, I would love to share where we can just find more about Sandra. That would be great. Um, yes, my website is www.storyutell.com, and that has a list of all my events. I do a lot of work at Mayo Clinic here in Phoenix right now. Great. I'm doing a lot of workshops through Changing Hand Bookstore. Mm. Um, I love the work, and I'm so glad that you um, are doing the same kind of work. Really, you are. We, we you. share that. It's powerful. Yeah. It's powerful stuff. I, we need a revolution here. That's, and, and isn't that all we're working on? And that's why I love, like, I have these guests on, and at face value, you and I might look completely different. You know, here I'm all tattooed and, and whatever. But our hearts are in the same exact space, right. and we're trying to help and serve in the same ways. And at the end of the day, what matters more than that? To me, nothing. So that's why I'm honored to have had you as a guest on the show. I am so supportive of the work you're doing. I'm so glad that uh, New, World, New World Library published this book. They're you know, one of my favorite publishers. I'm sure it's an honor for you to be with them. And uh, Right? I am honored to work with New World Life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're pretty amazing. Yeah. All right. Well, Sandra, thank you for your time. Thank you for your service in the world. And thank you for sharing the space with me. And uh, I'm excited to share it with our viewers and listeners. And I thank you, Chris. I, I love your work. And it's been an honor to talk with you. Very, very much vice versa. Thank you very much. Take care.